started. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to talk with you today about uh, the Pyramid Personality Integrator, the Pyramid. It is a tool that is pretty new. It, it just kind of reached the world the very end of 2015, but 2016 has been the year that this uh, new tool has kind of come out in the world uh, with some certifications, and, and people have started to hear about it and know about it. And so uh, we're going to take some time and talk to you about it today. Um, and so let's uh, let me take a look at uh, let's take a look at what we're going to be looking at on our agenda for the day. And so what we're going to be talking about over the next, certainly no more than an hour, probably not quite that long, is I want to talk about the, um, the Pyramid model. Uh, the, the, this is a, a Jung-rooted, a, a very nicely, purely Jungian model. And it, it sort of approaches type a very specific way. I want to talk about that. And I, I am not interested in talking to you today about the type model. And so this is not to teach you type. This is to introduce you to or remind you of how this new tool approaches type. Um, I want to um, show you some examples of how the pyramid approaches some of the core information in type. And so we'll take a look at uh, part one of the pyramid assessment. We'll look at uh, the, the difference between what's natural and what's demonstrated, that's huge. And then we'll take a look at the, uh, the functions of type as seen through the pyramid. Part two of the pyramid assessment is the very innovative flex index. We'll talk about what is this and why is it? What does it look like? And we'll talk about resilience and cognitive agility as brought to us by the flex index. And then most specifically, uh, what most people have been asking um, is, how does this compare to the Myers-Briggs? And you don't have to compare it to the Myers-Briggs. It's a nice standalone tool. And neither the Myers-Briggs nor the pyramid needs the other. But they, uh, they can be seen as competitors. And so what's, why would you use one and not the other? And, uh, and so that's worth our talking about, too. So that's where we'll end up our conversation there. So while we're here, a couple of things to, to tell you about. We have muted you because there are a number of people on the webinar. And we so just so that we, that doesn't cause too much confusion, we're muting you on this end. But that does not mean I'm not interested in what's on your mind or what questions you have. We will pause a couple of times, once kind of halfway through the content and again at the end of our session. And I'm very interested in what your comments are, what your questions are. And to the extent that I can, I will take those here on the webinar. Um, what I'm promising is that if I'm not able to get to all of your comments, my, I could imagine that there might be a number of them, uh, comments and questions. We are recording these and, and keeping your comments. And I will make sure, even by, by personally outreaching to you, uh, I will make sure that your questions have answers. So, um, so I please hold on to those and let me know what's on your mind when those times come. And the other thing is uh, is that we are recording this, and so uh, there there are people who want to be a part of this and aren't able to. And actually, there are people who might want to go back through it to you know what was that thing he said about, or, or just to hear it again, just know you have access to this content again in the future. Um, and so I am um, and very glad to have you on this uh, discussion about the pyramid. What is it and why is it? So let's, let's start off with a question. Um, and so have you ever been um, asked when presenting type, whether in a coaching setting or even if uh, this uh, in a training setting, has ever anybody ever said, uh, why do I have to choose? You know, so you've been talking about S and N or extroversion and introversion, and why do I have to choose? I do both of these things. Have you ever had to? Uh, have you ever gotten that question? Have you ever gotten that objection or question in a type setting? And so, go ahead and take uh, the um, uh, a, a minute and and vote yes or no. Have you? Is that the case? So I'll give it five more seconds. And then we'll see what we have here. All right. 
So we'll go ahead and so uh, yes, most people have. So about uh, 83 percent of you have gotten that question. I actually can't remember the last time I talked to anybody about type that they didn't actually say that. But uh, why do I have to choose? Or it's really hard to choose. I think I do both of these, and so the uh, this idea of of type mixing in with this idea of behavior and what I do and how much I do it, and it's it's uh, so it's a constant kind of tension within a a Myers Briggs based type discussion, and so I, what I want to do is start off with this idea of uh, of of the pyramid and one of the when you take the pyramid, you're actually given results that have both natural and demonstrated. So you come out with results that is natural type, and that's akin to the Myers-Briggs. Uh, and then you have a separate bit of information that's on demonstrated. What do you demonstrate? What do you do? What's your behavior? Let me take, a, take you through what the display is and what it means. That when you come out, so this is for extroversion or introversion, and what you have here is uh, the, the pyramid first shows you, well, so what's your natural, in this case, attitude, extroversion or introversion? So this shows somebody with a preference for introversion. But then we have something that is uh, also really rich in terms of the conversation is a circle score. For the, for the first time, we have data that isn't uh, that doesn't focus in on the sort the Myers Briggs and in some ways it's it's very nice it's very crisp the Myers Briggs is but it's a sort it sorts you into this or that um, and all the score does of course in the Myers Briggs is is a clarity indicator and so how much clarity do we have that the sort was accurate well the pyramid takes a different approach and it puts you on a continuum and so right here we have I sixty eight and you can read these scores, this circle score. Um, it's on a continuum as a percentile. So this is somebody who finds introversion more natural and finds introversion more natural than 68% of the population. And so in, when in taking a look at this, this uh, your, an I score is going to be anywhere from 51 to 99. Uh, and, and you can read those as percentiles. And so you've got this uh, this gradually moving set of data in the circle score, and so there's some. Uh, it, it's nice being able to have information uh, results that can actually help you distinguish if if I'm an introvert and you're an introvert. But there seems to be a, a bigger, a more urgent, or a bigger gravitational pull to introversion for you than it is for me. The pyramid lets you let you talk about that, and so. What is your natural attitude, E or I? What's the circle score? So the degree of uh, the, how much more natural it is for you than most people. And then what that leads to are, are some, some different ways of looking at that number. And so you can have a, a strong preference, a clear preference, a, a slight preference, uh, no discernible preference. And so, so how, how much pull, how strong a pull is there to whatever is more natural for you? Now, the, the, the last thing this, uh, that's contained in this uh, score here is this little green triangle. That's a question I frequently get. Um, I, in some ways, it's trivial and people don't need to know it, certainly. But I always get the question. And that is, how does my score, whatever that is, compare to the general population? I mean, so how do I compare to other people? And so the pyramid actually lets you know. These little green triangles signify um, the, the norm group, and the norm group is other people for whom it's natural to introvert, other people whose natural preference is for introversion. So compared to other natural introverts, how natural is this for me? Um, and also uh, kind of interesting in the pyramid is that even though my preference is for introversion, uh, it, it actually lets me know some information about extroversion. It actually gives me data on my extroversion score. And, um, and so you can see that, uh, that the display actually gives you introversion and introversion data, even though it lets you know clearly that this pull to introversion is stronger.
And so we, uh, so this is about natural. What, what's natural for you? What, what is my type? How am I hardwired is the assumption here. Interesting though, the pyramid also gives us, and this is the, the single biggest step forward, I think, in terms of discussing type. And that is, the, but what do you do? What, how, what do you demonstrate? And so right beside, in the pyramid, right beside your natural preference, which is I, um, you have your demonstrated attitude, which right here is E. And so this is somebody for whom introversion is more natural, but they more often extrovert. In fact, this person extroverts more than 58% of the population. And while these aren't mine, they could very easily be mine in terms of my, my preference personally is for introversion. I've always known that, and the Myers-Briggs helped me understand that many years ago. But my behavior, more often than not, is actually extroverted. I, I have a very extroverted profession. I speak, I engage, I perform, I, and, and so, so, so I'm out much of the time. And this enables me to see that and to talk about that. So what is natural is one thing, um, but what I demonstrate is also relevant. And that is what is offered here. And so how does my demonstration of extrovert compared to other demonstrated extroverts? Well, you can see where the, where the norms are there. And so one real interesting thing about the pyramid is this division between what is uh, natural and what is demonstrated. So the, I'm interested in your, in your questions. Don't forget, uh, we will pause in a, in, in a few minutes. And so think about uh, what you like about that, what you find challenging, what questions that provokes. Don't lose those because I am interested. Um, but not just yet. There's one other thing I want to fold in there before we get to that. Let's talk about the Pyramid model. Uh, how does Pyramid, uh, and this comes from Roger Pyramid, how does he choose to kind of demonstrate the type model? And so let's build it for you here. That the idea with uh, that this comes right from Jung is that the most important, Jung is very clear that the most important component of his kind of structural cognitive model was extroversion and introversion. It's the biggest difference between the two of us. Um, and so there are people who are extroverted and people who are introverted. And so that, that's the, kind of the, the doorway of the model. Now, within this extroversion and introversion, we are attached to these or driven by these cognitive processes. So there's perceiving. There's how we take in data. That's sensing and intuition. And we prefer one of the two of these. But we, so one is more natural than the other. But we actually do them both. We demonstrate them both to some degree, at least. Um, and then once we gather these information, we actually make a decision. We exercise our judgment. Now, the only ways in which the brain can judge, can make a decision, is by thinking and feeling. Uh, and we have a preference for one or the other of these, but we do them both. Functions, the function, sensing, intuition, thinking, and feeling, that's the core of type theory. Always has been, always has been, from the very start. Now, because of, and so this is a, a very nice graphic way of, uh, of presenting this model. Now, because of the, the primacy, the urgency of extroversion and introversion, that means that these four functions, sensing, intuition, thinking, and feeling, um, can either be extroverted. They're, they're extroverted manifestations of these functions. And in addition, there are introverted manifestations of these functions. So this model and the, the build on this model shows you the kind of the, the, the core, the structure of the personality theory that the pyramid then goes in and assesses. So before we get specifically into the functions, let's, let's, let's talk about the functions a bit. And so what, um, what I'm going to do is give you just a couple, but I, I'd like for you to think about the functions. And I'm going to give you a, a situation or an action, and I want you to just vote. Uh, here in terms of which of the functions 
is being represented by this action, right? And so well, let's start with this one. Remembering the details of yesterday's breakfast. If you actually took the time to, so, to recall, what are you doing if you're remembering the details of yesterday's breakfast? And so I'll give you a couple more seconds to, are you sensing? Are you intuiting? Are you thinking? Are you feeling? Is that a perception? Is that a judgment? What are you doing when you're recalling the facts from yesterday's breakfast? Right? Okay, we'll go ahead and broad, uh, broadcast those results. So, yep, most of you said that was a sensing function. It certainly is. And so one of the things that type theory tells us is that the sensing function is the function that, that serves us in two ways. Uh, one, it ties us into the here and now specific, the sensate reality of this present moment. Um, but it also, um, and that's true when, the, when sensing is extroverted, is tied into the world around me right now, but sensing can also be experienced in an introverted fashion. And we find that introverted sensing is that engagement of, of detail, of a past, what I know to have been true, the archive of all of those sensate realities that I've collected. But if I'm remembering the details of yesterday's breakfast, well, that's certainly the sensing function. How about, how about this? What, one more. And so knowing that someone is factually wrong, I, I hear you and engage with um, uh, w what you say is correct or it's not. It's true or it's not. And so what function am I exercising if I know or discern that you are factually wrong? Right. Um, okay, we're good. We'll go ahead and broadcast those. Bullseye, yep, uh, that, that's a thinking judgment. The, uh, and, and so if I am in deciding that yes, you're right, no, you're wrong. I like that, I don't. Uh, uh, I'm using my judgment. Uh, that could be T, that could be F. One interesting phrase, and actually, I got this from Roger Pierman, um, whose, whose tool we're talking about today, but that T, thinking, is the part of our judging function, it's the part of our brain that answers the question, is it true or false? True or false, that's an objective question. It's true or it's not. Um, now, Feeling answers the question, is it good or bad? Is something good or bad? Only your feeling function can answer the question, is it good or bad? Now, we as people use both thinking and feeling. Everyone does. Uh, the, um, what the pyramid allows us to do is, so which thinking or feeling, which one is more natural for us? Um, and then separate from that question, another important question is, what do you do more often? What do you demonstrate? Um, and so it, it lets us the natural and demonstrated. But what, um, what I want to do is, is take you into the more specific level of, uh, of information. And for the first time, we have an assessment that actually measures both natural and demonstrated for each of the eight functions, not just intuition, not just thinking, but extroverted intuition and introverted intuition, extroverted and introverted thinking, all eight of those. And the display is like uh, here on the on the screen. So we get a circle score, and we get it both for natural and for demonstrated. And it compares one to the other. And so how natural is each? How demonstrated is each? And, and so we really get to go to the function level of type. Now, on the surface, that looks actually really complicated. And a lot of type training doesn't and has not, for many people, gone to the function level. That's a little uh, kind of richer for some, more complicated for some than they want to go. But the nice thing about taking type training to that level, and even with the Myers-Briggs, although the pyramid makes this a lot easier, is that it breaks it down to the eight fundamental forms of mental functioning. It breaks the type model down to the eight fundamental building blocks, the eight Legos that we have, and enables us to understand each one um, so that we can understand how to access and how to get better at all eight, regardless of what our preferences are. Because as people, we're on the hook for all eight of them. And that's all there is. There can't, the only thing our brains can do 
are these eight things. And we bounce back and forth between the eight. And so if you have access to all eight, um, even the tough ones for you, well, then that that's a great developmental step for you. And so what we at OKA have done to extend this converse and really deepen the approach is we have training that's now focused in on identifying each one of these eight functions. What does extroverted sensing look like? What does introverted sensing look like? Um, we, we have a, a number of, of interactive activities, uh, 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 exercises, and, and even handouts and support tools that help kind of illustrate these different functions. So you know, one, how to spot them, how to match it up so that I know that for, for task X, I need tool X. Uh, and how to match up the tool, the function to the job. And here are some examples that uh, uh, an assessment or an um, exercise or support tool we put together that actually lets you know what are some questions that you can ask to prompt that function. If you ask that question, it demands that function's presence to answer it. And it even follows with some some exercises. Say, here's some things you could do, just like going to the gym and working out a certain muscle group, well, here's some exercises you can do to exercise that particular function. And so we have that for all eight. So that was introverted sensing, extroverted uh, thinking, introverted feeling. And so that we can zero in on not just identification of type and preferences, but the development of full type. And so uh, your preferences are for some of these, but even the ones you don't prefer, you still need to have some minimum level of confidence with, how do you do that? Well, let's work on that. And that's really what the pyramid focuses in on. Okay. And so I am um, interested in the questions that you have. Uh, so we talked about uh, the, the first part of the pyramid. It talks about your natural preferences and your demonstrated preferences. And it presents those uh, type data in a circle score. So now we have the range, the continuum line, which we're not, not used to seeing. And it actually gives us this information not only on the high level preferences, EI, SN, TF, but it also uh, goes down to the actual function level. Uh, and, um, and, and so if you care to drill into the function level, you can now do that. And so now at, a, um, at our kind of halfway point, I'm interested in any comments, any questions that you have about that uh, before I come around and show you part two, this, the, the second half of the, um, of the pyramid. And so in the chat box that you see, go ahead and type your questions. I see a couple of you are, um, are typing now. That's great. And uh, let me know what's on your mind and we can, um, uh, and we can um, go with that. Let's see. Uh, we make the slides available to us uh, later. So uh, the slides are, um, it, so you, this is being recorded as a webinar, so you have access to them that way. In terms of can you just have the slides, those are things that I give folks who come through the certification, but, uh, but they aren't available for folks who have not been actually trained on the, on the um, uh, material. And so that's, uh, that, that's uh, something that we've, we've tied to the certification. Um, I said, it looks like the pyramid could be a useful tool in working with type development. Your, your thoughts, it, it, yes, it can be. In fact, um, I think the, uh, the pyramid really took aim at the development process. And so rather than trying to discern what is your preference and how are you different from me, which the Myers-Briggs has excelled at for, for years, and then we still use it for that. And you can use the Myers-Briggs for development. I've, I've been doing that for years, and most of you have too. But, but it's not designed as a development tool. It's designed as an identification tool. Uh, and so the, uh, the, this is designed as the development tool. How do you access and exercise that development? It's, a, it's ideal for a coaching setting. Anybody that already knows I want to dive deeply into my type and think about my development, this is great. Um, one of the things we've been focusing in on the last year is how to 
um, use the pyramid in, in a group setting. We uh, have a number of different uh, exercise group processes that really um, utilize the pyramid information well for group level development work. So yes, I think that's, that's really the focus of the pyramid is the development of your type. Um, uh, so the, uh, how old is uh, Pyramid and does uh, uh, Cap teach this? And so the, um, the, I'm assuming you mean not Roger Pyramid, the individual, but how old is the Pyramid assessment? I, I assume that's what you mean by your question. Uh, Roger, I'm sure, hopes that's what you mean by that question. Uh, but uh, so the, the Pyramid is about a year old. The very first certification for the Pyramid was uh, in November of 2015. So it's about 11 months old. Um, it has, um, but it, it is, so 2016 is the year that most people have uh, have started hearing about it. So we're really at the very beginning of, of this uh, tool and its use. And the um, and so how um, uh, let, let's let's see the um, and, and the second part of, of that was how, how old is it and um, and I forgot the other part. Uh, uh, Jen's here, I know, helping me, but. Oh, this CAPT, but thank you. Uh, does CAPT teach? No, it doesn't. Uh, uh, that uh, CAPT, uh, the Center for the Application of Psychological Type, CAPT is, um, is uh, Myers Briggs, is the kind of resource you would go to for certification on the MBTI, but they are not in any way connected with the, uh, with the pyramid. And in fact, you, you won't have, uh, you won't find, and there isn't a facility that actually teaches certification level courses on both. Uh, on the certification level, it's one or the other. The MBTI is taught very actively and used very actively here at, MB, uh, here at OKA, of course, um, and the, um, as is the Pyramid, but, uh, but we don't have the MBTI certification any longer. Um, you have problems selling the Pyramid to a company pushing MBTI within the company. Um, and so, that, that, so how do you sell it and do you sell it and why would you sell one and not the other um, is the, uh, those are all good questions. I'm going to lump all of those together and push that question to the, to the end just because we talk about a side-by-side -side comparison. So that's a good one. Just know that's coming up. Uh, how's, how is this, so how is this different from MBTI Step 2? It's very different from MBTI Step 2 because uh, the, the, what the Step 2 tries to do is it has um, uh, kind of kind of claimed and come up with some, some subscales within this. So behavioral facets or subscales within each one of these and it um, where we have preferences. And so I can have an overall preference for extroversion but have a preference for um, actually receiving social energy, which is an introverted thing, and so I could be out of preference in certain facets. And so that's what the MBTI Step 2 tries to do. This is different because it talks about, uh, it, it keeps it overall, which is a sort of more general conversation in terms of what I, uh, what's natural, what's my wiring, but what do I demonstrate more often, um, which, which Step 2 doesn't doesn't do it, it. It actually doesn't take a look at demonstration of anything. It's it all. It still talks about wiring within. And so it's a, so step two is uh, and and pyramid don't don't try and occupy the same space at all. Um, the uh, one a lot of questions, and I, I I'm happy about that. Does this uh, does the natural preference and demonstrated attitude relate to the out of preference? So no no the um. We're talking about what's natural and what's demonstrated. Step two goes and tries to come up with some specific facets, but those facets aren't necessarily um, demonstrated. Again, that's it's, a lot of that is still uh, hardwired. It's not uh, it, so. This is not covering the same uh, the same ground. In the feedback from clients so far, what is your sense of how well uh, they're absorbing this tool? It seems complicated for groups who haven't already done some. All right. It, in some ways, it is easier, and in some ways, it is more challenging. Now, the, so the idea, anytime you're starting to talk about the the functions, so we're we're not just talking about S and N. We're talking about extroverted sensing and introverted sensing, and extroverted intuition, introverted intuition. So on one level, that it it seems more complicated. 
the where I actually find it easier uh, is because it's both. It's a it's, it's a longer report. It gives you twenty some pages. It gives you lots of rich information, um, and so it's it's rich. Uh, another way of thinking about rich is it's complicated. So yes, that's true. Um, at the same time, the um, the I. I always, and I can't recall an exception, but I, I, I always have a little struggle with folks in um, when I'm talking an introduction to type with the Myers Briggs about uh, well, why do I have to choose? And it seems like I do both of these, and the, talking to them about the difference between there's how you're wired, and then there's what you do, and your type and your behavior are two different things and trying to get beneath all of those behaviors that we engage to what is your preference. Uh, that's the essence of type and that takes time and it takes finesse. Some people get that immediately and others really struggle with it. Um, and that conversation, that little wrestling match, um, whether that takes two minutes or whether that takes substantial time and that changes for every group, is cut off at the knees. It, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and also because, and this is this is a big uh, another big change is that because the Myers-Briggs um, ends you up with um, kind of can lead you to a static type that actually produces a profile. Um, because that's the case, it's, I think, very important for people to go through type experientially to self-assess what their preferences are, then get their results back. That's standard 101 MBTI uh, presentation methodology, and I, I'm a firm believer that you need to do that. You would never just hand somebody their Myers-Briggs results and, and then jump in and explain what it means. You actually do a self-assessment, they put themselves in the model, then they get their results back. Well, because this uh, assessment, the pyramid, uh, does not actually uh, do that. It doesn't profile you. Nowhere in your pyramid results will it say that I am an INF. And JP doesn't exist, by the way, in this this is a Jungian-rooted tool, and JP was not a Jungian construct, overtly. And, and so it, it's not in this. And so we're talking about ENI, SNN, TNF. And, and nowhere does it sum you up as an INF, uh, and therefore here's your INF pro the profile. There's nothing to validate as far as that goes. This says... Um, you said that this is how natural I is, and you said this is how much you demonstrate I, and and so I start off my discussions with people. Here are your pyramid results. Let's talk about them, and and let's do some experiential work so that you understand what these numbers mean and how you use them, and which actually speeds things up, and and has landed very well. People actually like, of course, getting their results soon and not having to wait for a couple hours for them. And so, the um, so in some ways, yes, it's more challenging, but in a lot of others, it's it's so much easier. I think in the end, it's a wash. Um, and one of the things we do in our certification workshop, if any of you is interested in taking it that far, is talking about so how do you present this? How do you talk about it? How do you? What's a process that you can logically unfold this in a way that's kind of quick and experiential. Um, and so the um, somebody said this seems to take the MBTI to another level, more like temperaments and how people process and view information. It certainly takes type to another level. It approaches type from a different angle. I would um, uh, carry I would I would frame your your a statement a little a little differently. So rather than that, it it, it takes Myers Briggs to another level, it takes type to another level. This is if you think about type type theory as a swimming pool. Myers Briggs is one way in uh, to the swimming pool. Uh, maybe it's the diving board. 
Um, and well, this is the sliding board. This is a different way in. This is a, a, a different access point to these set of ideas. Um, that's possible. You could use both. You use the Myers Briggs, and then you want to come back and use the Pyramid as a as another add-on or as a as an additional uh, set of, of data. And you certainly can do that. I've done that uh, uh, quite a lot. But you don't need to, and this works fine as an entry point. I've never had type before. Well, uh, now you can. We'll talk about at the end of the discussion, which we're about to get back to. Um, we will talk about um, the uh, how we go about comparing the two, and when would you know to use one and not the other? Are the questions on the instrument the same as the MBTI? Somebody um, uh, asked. That's a good question, and somebody even gave it an amen, sister. There, it has a. Um, uh, no, no, they're not. They're very different. In fact, not only are the questions different, the me the methodology is is different, and it's it's uh, unique. I, I wish I'd thought to bring you a graphic of it, but there's a slider bar, and so with the Myers Briggs, um, it's it's a very specific choice to offer the questions in a forced choice format, and so you wake up on a Saturday, do you do X or Y, um, and that's a um, uh, that kind of reflects the dichotomous choice that you're uh, that we're trying to sort you on. Well, now there's a slider bar, and that is you wake up on a Saturday and you like to plan your activities. That's not one of the questions, but if it were, then, and then I would have a slider bar in terms of how how natural is this from not natural at all to very natural, and and then separate from that, how often do I do that? Um, and there's a slider bar. I can put the slider bar anywhere along the the way, and so it's so you're not forcing a choice. You, you can have this kind of gradual difference, and and every question that's asked is so how natural is it for you to do that? But then how often do you do it? Because sometimes there are things that aren't that natural, but I still do them every day. Um, or I don't do them. Uh, it's, it's so, but it's still natural, uh, and that's the. Uh, and, and so I, I can I have all of those options open to me. So the questions are different, but more importantly, the process of getting the data from you is um, is different. I think that's a, a big difference. So there's some great um, uh, questions here, and what I will promise you is that I will come back to the, and make sure that all of these questions, if they don't naturally get answered, uh, that you have answers to those questions. I did want to make sure because I, I know we're coming up to the top of the hour, and I want to make sure you get the last part of the. Um, thank you so much for for bringing so much energy and all these questions. I was afraid you weren't going to ask anything, so that's great. Um, so, the part two of the pyramid, and there are only these two parts, um, is the flex index. The idea behind the flex index is that because this is a development tool, and whether you do this on a on a with a team focus, or whether you do this one-on-one uh, -on -one through a coaching session, the whole idea is that we demonstrate di outside of what is natural with great frequency. Um, that we have to stretch outside of what is easy to do what is necessary all the time. Also, we have to use uh, we of the eight functions that our brain engages. Some of them are quite routine and easy. In fact, they're even attractive and energy building. But others are not. They're necessary, but they aren't any fun and they're challenging for us. To be effective as a human, we need to throw a wide net and get them all. So part of type development means you are stretched. Growth is stretching and growth is stressful. And so an essential part of this approach is this idea of flexing, how able are you to flex, to to have the cognitive agility you need to be able to stretch outside of what is easy to do what is necessary. We have the flex index as a way of looking at that. And so these are five aspects of our flexibility, uh, our cognitive agility, of our resilience. And we take a look at, and so in order, um, you've got um, proactivity, and so proactivity 
uh, is uh, talks about your ability to plan ahead, to predict what's coming, at, and to kind of structure your life in such a way, and to take initiative in such a way that you can work with and and plan through uh, the the details of your life and proactively engage it to reduce stress. And so, what you do when you get uh, feedback on the um, on the pyramid is it comes back looking like this. And so the the average response, if you if you're into the EQI at all, emotional intelligence uh, tool, the EQI, um, you'll recognize the scale. It's it's very similar to this, where the the mean is 100, and anything over 110 puts you in the top top 25 percent, and anything in the bottom under 90 is the bottom 25 percent. So you can kind of see how active am I in proactivity? How engaged in proactivity am I? And one thing that's very important is, in this is that these are um, valued scales as in you want them. The higher your score, the better. There is no data to suggest that too much of any of these things is a bad thing. And so, what the, so proactivity, so how proactive am I? Um, and then composure. Composure has to deal with your uh, ability to not take things personally, for you to engage some impulse control, your poise uh, in stressful situations, your composure. And so, and so here are your re, uh, reactions to or your score for composure. Uh, again, the the higher the better. And so when we take a look at, you don't need to see scores anymore, but the other three, um, uh, proactivity, composure, then you have connectivity. This is the degree to which I am connected to a social group. And within that social group, I am able to give and receive support. And so when the, the idea being of when I'm stressed and when I'm pushed to the edge, this lets you know about the group that will catch you and your uh, ability and tendency to let them catch you, connectivity. Um, as a stress reliever, variety seeking. This takes a look at your ability to see new situations, untried, untested situations, as actually sources of, of, of data, as, as challenges, as, as opportunities, um, rather than stressors, and actually even seeking out new situations to learn, to stretch yourself, variety seeking. And then lastly, rejuvenation. This is your ability, your tendency to take care of the mechanism, to take care of the machine. I'm resting, I am exercising, I'm, I'm eating well, I, that, that I have um, active stress tolerance engaged, and, and I am rejuvenating after stressful situations. So these um, five situations uh, are the uh, five elements of flexibility are very important to the overall structure of, of type development. And so what, what we do is, especially whether it's in coaching or whether in training, uh, we have a, a number of kind of activities and, and exercise and discussion points that are structured so that people have a sense of in what ways do I naturally take care of myself? Am I, am I naturally flexible? And in what ways do I need to work? Uh, well, I would be better off if I exercise what part of my flexibility or agility there. And of course, what, what we do when we train trainers and coaches on the pyramid is meld these things together. And so I need to work on my connectivity and I also would like to work on my extroverted feeling. And so what can I do to work on my feeling function so that at the same time I'm exercising this connectivity. And, um, and you'll find that, that there are a number of activities you can engage in that kill both of those birds with one stone. But the whole process is developmental. And how do I take care of myself and support myself during this development? So that's the flex index. It's become a very, uh, it's, it's actually a quite popular aspect of this tool. So the um, we're going to go back to your questions in just a second, but the uh, a, a number of the questions were about a side-by-side -side comparison with the Myers-Briggs. 
So let me just be real overt about it, and I'm going to take it one step clearer in terms of when do I, when would I use the Myers Briggs that I wouldn't use the Pyramid, and then flip that around. And so the the Pyramid really looks at items at the at the, the mental function level, whereas the Myers Briggs um, determines mental function based on a, a formula. And so what that means is. If you come out uh, with a certain type, you're an ENTJ or an ISTP, uh, because Jung suggested a certain hierarchy of the functions, your preference for I, S, T, and P therefore means that you're dominant and introverted thinking and you have an auxiliary of extroverted sensing and I mean the, the, the type dynamics formula is behind the curtain, but because Jung said so. I mean, because that's the, the model that Jung put forth. Well, what the pyramid does, because we can't prove that, because there isn't an assessment that's ever been able to point to your dominant, or your auxiliary, or your tertiary, uh, what the pyramid does is measure all eight in terms of how natural is each one, and how available, how much do you demonstrate each one. And so in a way, the pyramid is actually easier because it breaks, it, it doesn't engage the type dynamics model. Um, it doesn't deny it, it's just agnostic toward it. It, it doesn't, it, it never profiles you, it doesn't uh, nail you as a, or, or try to identify you as a static type, which means that all of the, the complexities that come with that and type dynamics are not anything the pyramid tries to take on. Um, the pyramid is really focused in on development, whereas the, the Myers-Briggs is really focused in on self-awareness is, is in terms of what is your preference, is it X or Y? Which could lead to development, but the Myers-Briggs doesn't overtly take you there. Um, the pyramid we talked about has, has slider bars as, a voice, as opposed to this forced choice format. Um, the flex index is, is added to the pyramid and uh, whereas that's not part of the, the Myers-Briggs. Um, natural and demonstrated versus type versus uh, Myers-Briggs does natural type. And all of the squares are presented on the pyramid, whereas the Myers-Briggs really focuses in on um, just taking a look at the scores for your preference, and it doesn't talk about your non-preferences. And so that's, um, while all of that is true, it doesn't really help us with the bottom line, so let me take you there. Um, I've used a type for 25 years and loved it, certified probably more people in it than anybody on the planet. We were very, very active and popular in that space for a number of years. I adore the Myers-Briggs. When would I use the Myers-Briggs and not the pyramid? Um, well, one, that is that the Myers-Briggs has the JP scale, and only the Myers-Briggs has the JP scale. There are other people that are other tools that have come as, as kind of derivatives, uh, um, uh, kind of um, uh, rip-offs of the Myers-Briggs that have a JP scale. But Myers-Briggs is the source. If you're into JP, I really want to talk about JP, um, well, then you, you need the Myers-Briggs. It, it gives you a static type. And that makes it sound negative, the static type. But well, some people really like leaving with some uh, with a, with an answer. I am this. Here's my tribe. Here's my identity. Here's what I put on my name tag or nameplate. I'm uh, I'm high on. I'm an INFP. And uh, and so if if that's what you're after, you won't get that with the pyramid. The pyramid uh, actively avoids the static um, type. Um, it's the MBTI is the gateway to type dynamics, dominant, auxiliary, tertiary, inferior. In fact, that's why Myers put the tool together in the first place and pulled JP as an overt idea from Jung's work was so that she could come down with a, a static type, a designation that actually reflected type dynamics, dominant, auxiliary, tertiary, inferior. That's the focus of the Myers-Briggs. Um, and and if that's what you're into, the, the pyramid doesn't get you there. That it's, it's intentionally focused in another area. Also, there's a known quantity. Some people just really like the Myers-Briggs. I like it. I've, I've taken it before. I've, it's on Facebook. We've chatted about it before. We've had it in this, uh, in this training before. I, there's a, 
uh, I, I feel like it's my familiar, uh, and I and I want it, and that's and so that's great. If if people are already tied to and invested in the Myers Briggs, go for it. If if they are coming to any self awareness tool uh, with goodwill and openness, don't stand in the way. Um, and so that's terrific. But there's a flip side of the coin, and so. What the pyramid offers that the Myers Briggs does not, and it's for these reasons I'm so excited uh, that as a type practitioner that I have a totally different set of tools now. Um, again, I am frequently wrestling with people in terms of what's natural and what's demonstrated, and realizing that your type and your behavior are two different things. If you've come through my training in the last 15 years, you've seen me do a Venn diagram that says don't get confused about type. And behavior; those are two different things. Uh, now we have a tool that can fill in both sides of that ledger. Uh, that, that here's how you're wired. That's natural. But here's what you do. That's demonstrated. Um, there is uh, so I think the the measurement data, uh, not only on natural and demonstrated, but on all of the functions, I think is uh, is also put on a continuum line. And which people are so much more comfortable with, uh, so they they like the fact that there's this sliding scale, and they're not put um, in one bucket because they actually feel like, yes, I get it, you're an extrovert, and so am I, but you seem more of an extrovert than I do. You, there's a stronger pull, there's more urgency for you than there is for me, and that's something that the Myers Briggs well, never denied it. It, it. it didn't feed the conversation. Now we can. Um, the flex index, the, this idea of resilience. Resilience as a topic is hot these days. We, we get lots of, of requests for it. And so now we have uh, not only a, a, a type-based uh, or type-related framework to, to cut, tie it to, but, um, but assessment data uh, that we can actually use on it to talk about flexibility, cognitive agility, resilience. And, and to tie that in with overall type development is a, is a real powerful piece that you can only get here. Um, this focuses in on, on um, individual type preferences and functions. And so rather than uh, the, the kind of the static designation of type, this has more to do with development. Uh, wherever you are, let's get better at something. And, and the Myers-Briggs, uh, good trainers have been taking the Myers-Briggs there, but the Myers-Briggs really isn't set up to have and to support that conversation of everybody stretch and get better. Um, and then finally, it's the new kid in town. Some people really like the, the, uh, the fact that the Myers-Briggs is so familiar, it's been around for so long, but just as many, just as many are saying, oh, the Myers, yeah, I've just, I've done that already, and I know that, I've checked that, is, is, what else do you have? Um, and so this enables you to talk about type, but to, to actually deal with the new kid in town. And there are just as many out there who want that. Um, and that uh, uh, seems trivial to many, but there are a lot of people who want what's new, who want what's fresh. And so those are the reasons why um, I would use one and not the other. Um, and so I would um, sort of, we're to the end, and um, uh, not the very end, because I really want to hear what's on your mind. And so the um, we're starting with a clean slate here. I would love uh, some of your uh, questions, and we'll I'll take as many of those as I as I can. We still have other people on the um, on the line, so let me know what's what's going on with you. What questions you have? Of all you guys, team reports and comparison reports from the MBTI. Does the pyramid have anything similar? Uh, the pyramid does not have a a team report, and the uh, they're actually looking into um, doing that because they've got a lot of requests, and so they're the the internal discussion now is does it pull off of what's natural? Does it pull off what's demonstrated? The uh, uh, does it aggregate both for everybody in a in a setting? And so they're they're trying to figure out how do we do this now while they're on while MHS the publisher 
is, is figuring out how to answer this from a reporting perspective. We at OKA have, um, have taken a look at, um, at, a, at a number of exercises that actually put into group context both the type information and the resilience information. And so part of what, uh, what you do when you're kind of certified through OKA is to actually get some interactive exercises, which come with their own kind of support tools to, to help create a behavioral portrait of a team through type terms and a behavioral portrait through the resilience terms um, to do just that. So it's, it's not exactly a group report, but it is a, a collective statement of how we act and of what we expect from each other both on the resilience front and on the type front. Um, in fact, just found out last week that MHS, the, the, the publisher and uh, OKA are going to partner in actually producing these, uh, um, these exercises. And so they will be standard fare for anybody who's in the Pyramid world. So that's a, a way to translate these data onto a group level, number one, and two, to have an experiential exercise actually a few of them, to actually get people interactive on, on all this information. Um, and that's a colleague of mine. Is there research yet on validity and reliability of the pyramid um, for those who need that uh, for buy-in? Uh, yes, absolutely. And in, in fact, the, um, the, uh, the psychometrics of the, the pyramid, realize this is published by MHS, Multi-Health Systems out of Toronto, Canada. They, and they produce the um, EQI and the Mesquite and a actually uh, almost 20 different assessments. They, uh, are, are, uh, they have rigorous standards for, um, uh, for their psychometrics. And that, so yes, there are. One of the things that, is, um, that actually makes it easier to do research on the Pearman as opposed to the Myers-Briggs is that the Myers-Briggs, because of how it's structured with this sort, you know, you're, you're this or that, um, it, it actually has always been psychometrically challenging to compare those to the other sea of instruments out there in the world that are actually set on, on more traditional continuous scales. Because the pyramid is, is a continuous scale, it's much easier to do apples to apples comparisons. And so, yes, there is, in terms of, of um, Everything from the light end to face validity to construct validity, uh, some nice um, criterion validity studies that are there. In addition to the um, where you see the, the the most interesting research is going to be in the flex index, um, because that is that should show that the higher your flex index on all those scales, the the better off you are, the more resourceful you are. Are the, the better feedback you get, those things, and, and that research, one is being done, um, and so it's already been started, but yes, there's uh, actually some nice uh, uh, pyramid research there for, for those who would like the, the proof in terms of show me that it's worked or uh, show me that the numbers support this. Um, I've not used MBTI in a static way. Jung said type is not static. We must remember that MBTI provides indicators not really preferences. I use type and EI instruments together with uh, EI emotional intelligence, I, I assume, with uh, an emphasis on development. Type develops emotions and behaviors are learned. And so uh, that's, um, uh, Jeff, ab that's absolutely true. I think your, your approach to type is, um, is more active, is more development focused than many. I won't even say most, but then then many. You're absolutely right. Um, and it, but it was the the act that um, uh, that so many people using the Myers Briggs um, get to the point where you're you've done the sort. You're this and I'm a that, and here's our profile. Isn't that cool? And 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 that's where it stops. And so that's not how people are taught when they're certified on the Myers Briggs to do that. And that's uh, but that's that's what so many people wind up doing. Um, and so the, um, it, which is contrary to Jung's approach. I mean, actually Jung was not in favor of the Myers-Briggs. He didn't stand in the way, but he wasn't really interested in the development of this. He, he actually thought of the Myers-Briggs 
and um, and he actually thought that the focus in on typology in terms of sorting this and that was was the least important part of his theory when so many people who use the Myers Briggs or use type use that and so this is a um, so this is a tool that focuses in on development if you've already if you have brought a voice, a developmental voice to your use of the Myers-Briggs, that's, that's terrific. Also realize you're in the minority. And so it, it's helpful to have a tool that is designed specifically to spur and support that, that work. It sounds like you are already doing a lot of that work. That's terrific. That's terrific. Jane Montgomery, I know that name. Do, uh, do the aspects of flexibility have opposites that uh, complement each other similar to the EQI? Right, so for example, if I want to stretch in proactivity, um, will I use connectivity to do this? Y yes, oh, that's a great question. Um, the, the, one of the beautiful things about emotional intelligence and the, the EQI model specifically is that within that uh, model, there's so many tensions that are that are held um, and, and complements. So the, uh, this has some of, of those. Um, I, I think the, uh, so for instance, that um, uh, there is a tension between, I mentioned proactivity. A lot of that is about structure and control. I'm going to, I'm going to initiate action to structure my world and, and proactively get in there to manage my stressors. And in many ways, there's a tension there between variety seeking, uh, which is as I as I come upon something that I didn't plan, that I didn't want, that I uh, that can I actually see that as an opportunity and actually as a as a chance to learn, as opposed to just get stressed and overwhelmed. So while not exactly, there's a there's a, a tension there, um, and that and so there can be some some complementing. Uh, there. I think that the more telling set of, of complements and tensions, though, is with those flex index pieces, and there are five of them, and type. And so that's the, that's the linkage, because it's easy at first glance to see the pyramid as this you know, cool, interesting type tool, and then there's this flex index hanging out there, that, uh, and that they, they aren't very related. Actually, they're, they're nicely related, and the more you relate them together. Um, that uh, that I think there is a, a linkage between, for instance, connectivity, my network, and and fostering that network, and the feeling function, and 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 to some degree connectivity and extroversion, and so so the more introverted I am, and the more I prefer T thinking, the the more challenging connectivity tends to be, and so there's there's a the tension, I think, the, the more, more telling set of tensions or complementary forces are with type and the flex index. And that's one of the things we make sure tie very closely together. The, um, have you seen Pearman used with the Pearson Mar archetypes, um, uh, especially with the OTCI group analysis? Wow, that's a, yeah, that's great. The uh, no, um, in terms of that, that has I have not seen any specific connection as in any correlation done between Pearson Moore and OTCI is actually out of is is an is an older tool that is now proprietary and not and can't be accessed by the public anymore. But the um, but the with the archetypal groups, I think there is a, a connection between because both. The concept of the archetypes that's the that Carol Pearson has come up with, and the functions that of course that are talked about with not only the Myers Briggs but but of course here more specifically with the Pyramid, both of these things, all of these things, grew out of a Jungian pool. So Carl Jung gave us both of them, and there are some connections in there. There's some connections to some of the functions and some of the archetypes. But this is not anything that has been developed such that it goes hand in hand. If you're interested in, in the archetypes, one thing just to let you know, that um, that is the, the Pearson Mar is a tool, um, and it is published by CAPT, C-A-P-T, and they are, um, 
and it is in development. I've, I've seen the, the, the newest version of the Pearson Moore, the archetype tool, and it is due to launch next year. Uh, by spring, maybe as late as fall, but next year. And, um, and it's going to be really sharp. Uh, and so I think there will be, once it kind of uh, is relaunched in its, in its new revised form, I think it and uh, I think that's going to be the time when you'll start to see the Pierman and the Pearson uh, have some things dovetail together. And since we here at OK actively use them both, if you're interested in either, uh, stay plugged into us and, uh, and I'll even help you with those big stitch together. I know I'm actually going to do that. Um, when will the activities be available that you referenced? OK is doing them behavior. OK. Um, the, uh, we are, the, the activities we put together, and the 10 exercises that we've uh, come up with, so gr group and team and organization kind of uh, activities and, and some support materials that go along with those that um, specifically designed for use with the, the pyramid and individuals and groups are now associated with our certification. So we, we give them to folks who come through certification and, and teach you how to do those. Now, they are going to be available to the, um, uh, to the public and we are, are, are hoping for by um, spring of 2017. Um, now, that is the, um, I, I think certainly by, uh, we have a training in March, we're shooting for that, but certainly by uh, late spring, early summer, by everything will be out next year, published through MHS. And one thing we're doing in the meantime is anybody who comes through the certification, we have a certification at the end of October, um, actually gets access to everything. So we, get, we give you all of the exercises to use in the interim until they're ready and put on the shelf. So if anybody is, um, is interested in not only the, the exercises, but in coming in, you, you get quite a lot with that certification. Um, uh, in addition to being certified, a, a lot of behind curtain stuff on how to run trainings, how to sell and position it, and specific exercises to do. So I, I hope that helps you with that. I think Roger has a nice uh, uh, innovative tool. My hope would be that there is a true emphasis on the roots uh, of all the various instruments. Uh, and uh, finally, the MBTI was developed based on what was needed at the time. Now Roger has developed an appropriate tool for, for now. Um, and the, um, I, um, so I, I agree with that. Uh, Jeff, I appreciate your saying that. One, one of the things, just to be sure, I think, um, uh, I believe, and it's very clear in, um, uh, I, I think, that the Myers-Briggs is in going anywhere. It's, it's nice, still, one of the most popular tools uh, around. It's, it's one of the only tools that no matter where I say it, everybody knows it. They at least know what, what I'm talking about. And, and so the Myers-Briggs is still a tool that is fully used now. Um, I, to Jeff's uh, comment, I think it um, uh, many of us who've used type and the Myers Briggs uh, have used the Myers Briggs over the last number of years. Um, it, even if we love it and use it all the time, there are a few things that we have to work on that are always kind of points of tension or, or points of contention that we have to uh, kind of work with. One of the things that uh, that the pyramid does is address those. And so how can we keep the richness of type but avoid that conversation or kind of cut that off at the knees? And so that's, uh, so it really does give us a new way in. Um, and anybody who wants to go deep, um, if you're using this and if, you're, if your primary approach is through coaching, I, I don't think it's much of a, I don't think it's much of a, of a debate, I, I think the the pyramid is going to to give you more more to talk about and a better conversation than does the Myers Briggs. Uh, the um, because in, in terms of of emphasizing the tool for now, if you if you want a deep dive, I uh, I I would I would not consider the Myers Briggs. I would go straight to the pyramid. Uh, I think the debate is you've got a large group. And you're trying to decide which to use. I think that's a 
it's an interesting discussion. I think you could wind up in one camp or the other and totally defend your choice. Um, and the um, and so uh, so good. The cat is doing this. So just realize uh, with that, just to be clear, the cat doesn't have any connection to the pyramid. The cat does not have anything to do with the pyramid. Uh, what the thing the cat is doing is the is the archetype tool, the the, the Pearson Mar, and and it's just it m makes our lives a little more challenging that one is Pearson and the other is Pyramon, but the uh, uh, but that's the um, but the cap has always been the publisher of that and is continuing to. But I, I don't want anybody to uh, think that cap is doing the Pyramon. It, it is not. That's MHS out of Toronto. Um, well, we are up at the top of the. In fact, we we're up at the top of the hour, 12 minutes ago. And so I appreciate uh, those of you who uh, logged on, and uh, it looks like most of you stayed. And so I appreciate that too. I am um, just to remind you that part one of this discussion was just here's what the tool is, here's some interesting things about it, and um, we've done that. And I will, if I didn't get to your question, I will um, post an answer um, to it to make sure all of this content is covered. On Friday, uh, we have part two of this discussion, and um, we will send you uh, information reminding you of the login information. But that's where we actually look at these exercises that I've been alluding to and talking about. What, so what are we doing? What are the exercises? What do they look like? What do they sound like? And so you have some sense of what those things are. And so if you're interested in the kind of experiential uh, exercises or the kind of support that you get with the, with the pyramid, I think you'd be interested in, in that. And so I hope to see most of you back, um, at least in this forum, on Friday. And so until then, uh, have a great week. Thank you for giving us an hour and 15 minutes of your time today. And I look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.